The following is a reading from Pike and Hayward's Cases of Conscience. What advice can be given to a person grievously distressed with fears, doubts, and unbelief? In perusing the subsequent letter, the query may be more fully understood. Sir, as you desired in your last letter to know the particulars of my unbelief, of which I complained in my preceding letter, you will find my compliance with your request in the following lines. The most settled and general part of my unbelief may appear by the following hints. I cannot view Jesus Christ in that loveliness, excellency, and preeminence as I find him set forth in the word of truth. I cannot find sufficient ability in my soul to believe in him wholly and unfeignedly. And how can I believe in him without a right view of him? Sometimes I can set him forth to others in the words and light of Scripture, so that I believe many of the children of God have their very souls nourished and fed by what I say. And upon certain times I myself am much delighted in and with the work. But when I retire into myself, and consider the barrenness of my soul, my strangeness to an alienation from God, Jesus Christ, and so on. I conclude that my good frame and my delight in preaching proceed from the agreeable frame of the people, rather than any good that is worked in me, that God will endue me with a measure of light in his word and grant me some delight in the ministration of it for the benefit of his people, yet not for any love or regard he has to my person. Again, though I preach Christ to others, yet I question whether Christ be in me and I in him. A person cannot experience a true joy except he believes, and because I cannot rejoice at the very thoughts of grace, death, and resurrection, and the like, I'm afraid I do not truly and sincerely believe. Believers are exhorted to rejoice always, but I cannot rejoice when I ponder upon the most important concerns of my soul. Therefore, I fear I am not a believer. Alas, I am not able to look steadily upon Christ as my Savior. At times when I join with the saints in divine worship, I am pretty confident of an interest in Christ. But when I retire, I conclude that that proceeds only from a kind of heavenly gale upon them, or else upon myself merely to capacitate me for more use and service among them. I conceive that my heart is not in the least renewed but in the sense of scripture, is still a stone. I do not question God's everlasting love to his people as much as I do his love to me. What will it avail me to know that God is unchangeable, and that his unchangeableness is a stronghold to his people under all their instabilities and vicissitudes, when at the same time I cannot conclude that he has loved me? Are there not some whom he never loved? I fear I'm one of those." If he has not loved me, all the things in heaven and on earth, nay, his infinite power cannot prevail with him to love me, seeing he is unchangeable in his nature. I do not question the ability and capacity of Jesus Christ to save to the uttermost even the vilest and chief of sinners, so much as I question whether he will save me, not because he cannot regarding his capacity, but because he will not, not because my sins are so great and numerous are more than he can take away, but I fear lest he should leave me to die in them. One sin is enough to condemn, except there be an interest in Christ. I do not so much call in question perseverance and grace as I do the beginning of grace in me. If I were sure that the good work of grace was begun in my soul, I think all my other doubts would flee away and vanish. But while I doubt at the very beginning of the work, I cannot be confident in anything that may profit me. If I did now endeavor to resolve, believe, and conclude myself to be a gracious person, and that it will be well with me at last, notwithstanding all my fears, and so strive to be comfortable, not giving way to doubts any more, such confidence would but vanish after all to my endless horror. I endeavor to perform every secret duty in religion constantly, but fear all my aim is to quiet an uneasy conscience. I diligently observe every public duty as a professor of the Christian religion and as a minister of the gospel, yet often fear the whole terminates in self and vainglory, so that I have my reward. 
I am acquainted with many far and near who, I believe, are godly persons, and I am of opinion that the greatest part of them, if not all, judge me to be a truly gracious man. Nay, I am confident they look upon me as a person eminent in grace, but all that does not amount to a proof of the power of godliness in me. Neither does it evidence the least degree of supernatural grace in my heart. I think the pious people who hear me preaching and praying conclude that I am very comfortable in my soul, and that I enjoy much communion with God in the discharge of duties. But their conjecture is no evidence that I enjoy the least grain of solid comfort. Though their favorable judgment should yield me some groundless joy for the present, yet if I am not born again, it can yield me no sweet consolation at death and judgment. I am endued with some measure of light in all the doctrines of grace, which I believe are consistent according to the scripture, and I am enabled to express and set them forth according to the consistency of my ideas against the oppositions made to them, both in private conference and in a more public manner. But that doesn't profit me. While I imagine that I am an utter stranger to any experience of saving grace in my own soul, even Satan knows that all the doctrines of grace are remarkably harmonious, yet he is not in the least more happy for that. I am in the general persuaded that all those who believe in Christ shall be saved, but as I cannot believe, how can I be saved? The word says that perfect love casts out fear. I fear greatly. I cannot be confident, but rather disbelieve. Therefore, how can the love of God dwell in me? If I don't love God, what is my state better than that of the most profligate? Though I understand something of the doctrine of grace, I understand likewise by the same doctrine and by experience that nothing can persuade me to believe in Christ but the Spirit of God. And if I should believe in Christ, I perceive that it is impossible for any to conceive that my faith is of the right kind, except it be by the same Spirit. Therefore, oh, that God would be pleased to make use of some means, some words, some instrument, or instruments to resolve my doubts and dissipate my fears for his own glory and my present and eternal comfort and advantage. Oh, where shall such a messenger be found, an interpreter that would be to me one among a thousand? Sincerely, end of letter. Pastoral Counsel my advice is this, that such a person should instantly attempt his duty to believe on Christ afresh, just as he did at first. When he cannot come to Christ as a believer, let him come as being in himself an every way helpless and miserable sinner, and let him do this instantly and repeatedly, as soon and as often as he is attacked with fear from his felt and future dreaded misery. Nothing like a fresh act of faith to baffle Satan's temptations and the suggestions of his own unbelieving heart that he is yet in a state of unbelief. If the grand enemy of souls can but get believers to reason the point with him, whether they have believed or not, from past experiences in the time of veiled evidences, or from present experience at a time of suspended influence, he knows he will lead them at once into an endless maze of sore perplexity to God's dishonor and to the wounding of their souls exceedingly. Let such a person then attend the Savior's voice. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. Here such a person may see that the words divide themselves naturally into two branches. The first respects duty, looking. The second respects privilege, salvation. And the command is given to sinners at the greatest apprehended distance from God, by sin, at the very ends of the earth. Let such a person then, as a sin-wounded soul, an apprehended law-condemned sinner, a Satan-accused and a conscience-condemned sinner as well, instantly look up to that great Savior who is exalted on high, to save to the uttermost every poor soul that looks unto him for the whole of his salvation. For as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so once was the Son of Man lifted up on the cross, and now is the Son of Man is a great ordinance of God for a sinner's salvation lifted up to his father's throne. 
and in the glorious gospel to be looked unto by a perishing sinner for his eternal life, as a stung Israelite was to look for healing by God's appointment to the brazen serpent, and having looked, let such a person instantly attempt his further duty to believe that he shall be saved in looking. Let him credit the word of truth, the royal grant of the Prince of Grace from his high throne of his everlasting salvation, and is looking unto him. For lo, he says unto all and unto every one of them, Be ye saved. The word has gone out of his mouth in faithfulness, in immutable, omnipotent grace, and he will not, cannot reverse it. He is God and he cannot repent. Once he has spoken, it stands fast forever. His unchanging word, of all producing grace and glory, stands engaged for that soul's salvation eternally. And thus, he himself, who is a faithful and true witness, tells us that the inseparable consequent of his being looked unto is lifted up is salvation, that whosoever believeth in him, i.e. looks unto him to answer the type, should not perish but have everlasting life. Now let such a person consider whether this solemn declaration of the great Savior is not worthy to be credited by him instantly and constantly for God's glory and his own joy. Whoever or whatever from within or without him says to the contrary, can he doubt it if it is but for one moment without grievous sin, without making the God of truth a liar? He must, even in this, either set to his seal that God is true or give his truth a lie. Again, let such a person observe that is looking unto Christ for salvation in obedience to the divine command is faith's first and direct act unto which the promise of life in the sacred word is annexed. And his persuasion of salvation is an after and reflex act of faith that is and ought to be founded upon the promise given to him as a believer in Jesus. The former respects his eternal security, the latter God's glory and his more abundant joy. If he has now put forth a direct act, he is and ever shall be in God's account, and according to his written word, a true believer. And though he may not at present make conscience of the reflex act, or may be obstructed in the exercise of it by Satan and unbelief, this makes no alteration in his state as a believer, but only robs God of that glory which he ought to give to his Savior, and himself of that joy which is his soul's desire, and a full persuasion of God's everlasting favor. Dear Sir, take a few hints, and you tell us that you still dread yourself to be an unbeliever. As to this, if I understand you right, you take believing in Christ through the main of your letter to be a believing your interest in the Savior to the joy of his infinite favor. This is answered above, as being that which does not constitute your state as a believer. It is a direct act of faith in looking, coming, fleeing to the Savior. That puts a specific difference between you and all the unbelievers in the world. Indeed, sir, in this closing part of your sentence, you preface it with your being tempted to doubt of these several articles of faith. You do well when thus assaulted to endeavor to conclude that they are the darts from Satan, but as to their not being the disposition of your mind, you must distinguish between your new and your old mind. Darts from Satan, they are most certainly to wound your new mind, and to excite in your old its native infidelity. For in you, though a believer there dwells and works unbelief, in Satan's temptations to disbelieve the doctrines of faith, as well as our acts of faith, may more or less draw out the forces of our unbelief with respect to both. And what Satan suggests is a disposition of your own mind so far as it is unbelieving. But this remaining unbelief ought not in any wise to make you doubt of your having the grace of faith in your heart. For if you had not faith in those doctrines, your temptations to doubt them would be to you no affliction. It is your new mind, or your soul, so far as it is renewed by grace, and blessed with the grace of faith that is grieved and distressed with temptations too and the workings of unbelief. Again, sir, you say I cannot view Jesus Christ in that loveliness, excellency, and preeminence, 
as I find him set forth in the word of truth. I cannot find sufficient ability in my soul to believe in him wholly, entirely, and unfeignedly, and how can I believe in him without a right view of him? Let me ask you, have there been no moments in which you have viewed Christ in that loveliness, excellency, and preeminence in which you have set forth in the word of truth? If you have ever seen his glory when presented to your eye of faith by the Holy Ghost in the word of truth, how did you esteem of him then? Did he not then appear in your view to be transcendently excellent? A Savior, none like unto him. If he did, this was faith in your understanding, discerning, or seeing of the Son. And how did this work upon your will? Did not your will bow to and choose the Savior be held as and to be your Savior? If it did, this is faith in your will, and hence did not your affections go out after him? Was he not altogether lovely, or all desires unto you? If so, this is faith in your affections, or that faith which works by love to all its surpassing and altogether lovely object. And have there been no moments in which the blood of Christ and its cleansing and pardon and peace-procuring efficacy has appeared sufficient to your conscience, and which his righteousness is your desired justifying dress, has appeared all glorious, and which his fullness is sanctifying grace, unto an increasing and perfect meekness for eternal glory appeared to you most precious and soul-satisfying? If there has, this was faith in your conscience, and so you have been blessed with a spiritual, a supernatural ability to believe in Christ wholly, in a whole Christ, with all the powers of your soul so far as they are renewed. And whether you refer this faith to its direct or reflex act, it is true with respect to both, so far as they are put forth. You believe wholly in a whole Christ, with all the powers of your soul, so far as they are sanctified initially. And yet with regard to the unrenewed, unsanctified part, which still remains in your every faculty, you may be said as truly not to believe in Christ wholly, i.e. with all the powers of your soul, as entire faculties, as darkness in your understanding, rebellion in your will, earthliness in your affections, and legality in your conscience still remain. But your regenerate part, being your leading principle of action, your acts of faith therein are in every power of your soul therefrom, on and in Christ. From hence you are denominated a believer in him. And however unbelief in your unregenerate part may be permitted to work, this does not in the least injure that your state. You add, Sir, sometimes I can set him forth to others in the words and light of Scripture, and upon certain times I myself am much delighted with the work. But when I retire into myself and consider the barrenness of my soul, my strangeness to and alienation from God, Jesus Christ, and so on, I conclude that my good frame and delight in preaching proceed from the agreeable frame of the people rather than from any good rod in me. To this I reply that your retiring into yourself to consider your own barrenness and so on is from the weakness of your faith and its reflex act which ought to be strong in and towards a promise given you in Christ upon your first direct act. Abraham considered not his own body being dead, nor yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, believing that which he had promised he was able also to perform. And it is an excellency in Abraham's children, Abraham-like, to be strong in faith, to consider the promise and God's power and faithfulness, and not their own barrenness. Your conclusion, sir, that your delight in preaching Christ proceeded rather from the agreeable frame of the people in hearing, I think is ill-founded. As you afterwards say, at times when I join with the saints in divine worship, I'm pretty confident of an interest in Christ. Now, sir, as I take it, this is your confidence of an interest in Christ, while preaching him to others, is a ground of your supreme delight in the work, though from the additional pleasure in your being an instrument to exalt your beloved before others, and thereby to win them unto faith in Jesus, and to build upon those who have believed through grace 
on their most holy faith, and your faith of interest in Christ, which gives you a supreme delight in the work, is a pregnant proof that God has wrought in you faith's good and saving work. Once more, you say, God will endue me with a measure of light in his word, and give me some delight in the ministration of it for the benefit of his people, yet not for any love or regard he has to my person, as a person is favorable to a nurse while nursing his children, but when her work is done, he turns her off as one that is not of his family. This, sir, is a temptation and an affliction that is common to you, with others of your ministering brethren as well. The grand enemy, though he cannot destroy the Lord's servant eternally, by this he strives to destroy their joy in his service temporally. He well knows that what the Lord's servants love supremely, which is himself, and his special favor eternally, they cannot bear a thought that they must part with these without pain of extremity. No, dear sir, God has adopted you as a believer into his family, and from his love to your person he calls you to be a servant to some of your dear brethren. And having put you among the children of his infinite favor, you shall abide in his family forever, and possess with the rest his great self as your vast and eternal inheritance. If you believe the Savior's ability and doubt his will to save you eternally, come and test this. Come in all your discerned pollution and misery and fall down before him and say, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus moved with compassion, will say, I will be thou clean.